Okay, well, thank you, Staz, and thanks very much for, the, um, for handling the visit here. My first time in Russia, and um, it's certainly uh, really great to see St. To see, to see Petersburg. Um, so um, I, I'm going to give a talk which um, <clears throat> I hope would be accessible to uh, uh, a wide range of people. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't use anything very, um, uh, very profound in ter in ter on the geometric side, but um, I, it... it um, it's um, a problem that I've been uh, interested in for the last seven or eight years, actually, and, and there's still, it's a, a simply stated problem which is, is, is quite hard to, um, um, uh, to solve many aspects of. So, so, let's see, I guess this doesn't work, right? Okay, so... Um, that one? Yeah. Okay, and so um, I'm going to first... Um, uh, uh, give an introduction to what might be called spectral geometry, just in a very uh, general way, and I want to motivate the problem I'm going to consider. And um, the problem I'm going to talk about is an eigenvalue problem, which is called the Steklov problem. Uh, maybe it's well, more well known in Russia than it is in, in the United States, but it actually has been studied um, classically. It was invented in the uh, early 20th century, and there are many, many papers on it, but uh, it's not the most common eigenvalue problem. Um, people more often look at the Dirichlet or the Neumann problem, so-called, and, and, uh, but I'm going to introduce that in, in part two, and then, um, and then in part three I'm going to talk about some background on what's, what's been done and, and on the Steklov problem and motivate the question that um, uh, uh, we considered. Uh, and then in part four I'll talk about the, um, uh, the, the theorems that we have and, and, and also a recent paper on, so most of the work, uh, the positive results here are in two dimensions, they're for surfaces. And, um, and so recently we looked at analogous higher dimensional questions and, and mostly the, the, um, the results are in the negative in the sense that one expects very different uh, things to be true, but I'll talk a little about that at the end. And so, um, uh, so let me just <clears throat> introduce sort of the idea of in spectral geometry. So if you take a, a smooth um, surface or a higher dimensional manifold, then uh, when you choose a Riemannian metric uh, on the manifold, then it, it enables you to measure lots of things. But one, one of the, the, the uh, quantities of interest in this talk are the eigenvalues of the Laplace operator. So the metric gives you a, uh, a uh, Laplace operator, Laplace Beltrami operator, uh, and uh, if the manifold is, is closed and compact or if, or if it's it's compact with boundary and you impose appropriate boundary conditions, then there's a, a set of eigenvalues, um, which is a discrete set of real numbers start, starting at, often at zero and then um, uh, lambda one, lambda two, uh, et cetera, and they tend, they tend to, um, to infinity. Uh, and so the idea here is a kind of physical idea. So the idea is to think of the manifold as a, as a drum, perfectly elastic drum, and then, um, and then the, the eigenvalues are the, um, the, the fundamental frequencies of the drum. So they're the periodic, the time periodic, correspond to the time periodic vibrations uh, of the drum. Um, okay, and so then uh, the kinds of questions that geometers ask is, um, is um, how does the geometry of the manifold, uh, how is it reflected in, in the spectrum, in, in the eigenvalues? And so there are lots, many, this is a very old subject, there are many, many uh, results in this direction. So often, to control eigenvalues, you need assumptions um, on the curvature of the manifold and uh, possibly other, other quantities like volume or diameter. But there, there are a few cases where um, there are bounds that actually depend only on the topology of M, and they're essentially metric independent. And, and so I'm going to be interested in that kind of um, result today. And, and there's a, the prototype theorem is a, a theorem that goes back to 1970. Uh, and it's due to Joseph Hirsch, who's a Swiss uh, mathematician. Uh, and the theorem is that if you take the two-sphere, that is the standard um, uh, uh, two-sphere, then, uh, and if you choose any, any smooth metric on the two-sphere, then uh, there's an upper bound on lambda one, so lambda one is the first non-zero uh, eigenvalue, multiplied by the area. So, so the product of lambda one times the area in two dimensions is a, uh, 
is a, uh, a dimensionally, uh, dimensionless quantity. So if you scale the metric by a factor, uh, the product of lambda 1 times the area doesn't change. The, 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 uh, the eigenvalue scales like 1 over distance squared and the area grow, goes like, dis, like a distance squared. So, so that quantity, uh, so lambda 1 times the area is, um, uh, is scale invariant. And the statement is that it's always bounded above by 8 pi. And the number 8 pi is precisely the number you get for the standard unit sphere. Say, take the unit sphere in R3, its area is 4 pi, and its lowest eigenvalue is 2. So the, the product is 8 pi. So another way to state the, to state the Hirsch theorem is that, uh, is that among all metrics on the 2 sphere where the area is normalized, so if you fix the area, then the largest eigenvalue occurs for a round metric. Okay, so that's, a, that's equivalent to, to, the, to, the, um, to the statement. Okay, and so, and so metrics on spheres, we have the round metrics. So I've got one of my favorite round metrics there, which is a baseball. It's not quite round because of the seams. But, and then there's the blue sphere there, which is round. And so Hirsch's theorem says if you take any other metric, so that dumbbell shape there on, <clears throat> on, the, um, uh, on the bottom is, a, is, is a, a different metric, represents a different metric on the two sphere. And this bunny is a standard, if you fill in the eyes, the other, the other um, things that make it non-simply connected, then, then it's a, uh, it becomes a, also a metric on the two-sphere. And so Hirsch's theorem says that, says that the first eigenvalue of either of those two irregular shapes will be always smaller than the corresponding first eigenvalue of uh, a round sphere with the same area. Okay? So that's the theorem. However, Hirsch's theorem, I, I should say, these, these are th those are metrics on the two-sphere which are embeddable into R3. So not every metric, in fact, most metrics on the two-sphere cannot be visualized globally in R3. So, so, um, so in fact, Hirsch's theorem is more, allows a larger class of metrics. So any, any abstract uh, Riemannian metric on the two-sphere um, <clears throat> can be considered in Hirsch's theorem. Okay, and so um, um, uh, one way of motivating what, um, what um, I'm going to talk about is, um, is um, we... Um, we, uh, we're looking for an analog of this theorem for surfaces with boundary, or, or for manifolds with boundary. And so, um, if, if you consider uh, a manifold with boundary, then, then um, the standard sort of eigenvalue problems, as I mentioned, are the Dirichlet and Neumann problems. So, if you think of, the, of a domain as a drum, then the Dirichlet problem uh, corresponds to uh, fixing the drum at the boundary. So the so the the eigenfunction is the displacement from equilibrium when you when you beat the drum. And so the Dirichlet problem means you take zero boundary data. And so that's one of the standard eigenvalue problems. And in fact, there is a very famous extremal problem for um, uh, for um, the Dirichlet eigenvalue problem, and that's called the Faber-Kron inequality, which. Uh, was proven around 1920, and it, it asserts that um, if you normalize the volume uh, of a domain in Rn, so if you take a domain, say a, just a bounded domain in Rn, and if you, if you look at other domains with the same volume, then the domain with smallest lambda 1, that is Dirichlet first eigenvalue, is a round ball. So it's called the Faber-Kron inequality. It's very closely related to the isoparametric inequality. Um, actually, it was originally a conjecture of Lord Rayleigh around 1890, and was solved about 30 years later by Faber and Cron. And so, um, so that's a that's a, a um, well-known extremal result there. But um, we're interested really in in not just metrics that arise on domains in Rn, but we're interested in, in more general Riemannian metrics. And so if you ask the, the, the question of whether the Faber-Kron inequality could generalize uh, for other, to other metrics, then you see pretty easily that, that it doesn't. In, in fact, if you, take, um, if, you take, uh, if you just take the two-dimensional disk and you consider a domain which, uh, uh, you consider a metric which is almost the whole two-sphere. So here's our disk. So it's a, a metric of curvature one. It's a round metric, which almost so it's it's a disk, but it, it almost covers the sphere. Then it's not very hard to see that when you shrink this uh, the the uh, the exterior of the disk to zero, the lowest eigenvalue lambda one goes to zero. 
Okay, and so in particular, Faber-Kron inequality says if you fix the area, there should be a lower bound on lambda 1. Okay, and that's just not true in this case. That the area is essentially fixed, but the lowest eigenvalue can be arbitrarily small. So the Faber-Kron inequality really is an inequality for domains, which doesn't have a nice generalization to, um, to uh, uh, general, more general uh, manifolds or surfaces. And so let me then look at the Neumann problem. So that's the second standard uh, eigenvalue problem for um, uh, manifolds with boundary, and, and so the, the Neumann problem physically corresponds <coughs> to a excuse me <coughs> to a, um, a a vibrating drum where the where the boundary of the drum is allowed to move freely on a frictionless cylinder. So so the the drum is not fixed on the boundary, but <coughs> but the boundary moves on a uh, on a cylinder, and you assume it's it's frictionless. It's an ideal ideal drum, and so it corresponds to eigenfunctions which have zero normal derivative at the boundary. Okay, and so the, <clears throat> that lowest eigenvalue is often called the eigenvalues are called mu's instead of lambdas, uh, and um, um, <clears throat> and in fact there is a, there is a, a, another well known upper bound in this case. So so it turns out that that the natural extremal problems are to minimize Dirichlet eigenvalues and maximize Neumann eigenvalues. And so, um, and so there's a, a theorem of Zago from uh, 1954, which says that among uh, simply connected uh, plane domains of a fixed area, the disk maximizes uh, mu1. Okay, and in fact, a, a couple of years later, the result was generalized to arbitrary domains by, uh, by Weinberger. <clears throat> and so again, it's true that for domains, the the um, um, if we fix a the volume, then then mu one is maximized by uh, around by a ball. And actually, if you look at the Hirsch theorem, which I didn't give you the proof, but but the Hirsch theorem actually also works for um, uh, for um, for uh, uh, surfaces with boundary for the Neumann boundary condition. So in fact, if you look at metrics on a disk, uh, the Hirsch the the same proof as the Hirsch as, as the proof of the Hirsch theorem gives you the same inequality, namely mu1 times the area is less than or equal to 8 pi. Uh, and on the other hand, the bound is not achieved. So it often happens in eigenvalue problems. You may have a sharp inequality, but the extremal configuration doesn't actually exist. In other words, it, it degenerates in some way. And, and what happens, I don't even have to redraw the picture because the same picture, if I consider disks which degenerate to a sphere, where this, that is the boundary uh, curve shrinks to zero in length, uh, it shrinks to a point, then, then if, you, if you look at the lowest Neumann eigenvalue for this problem, it actually converges to two. Two is the lowest, this is the unit sphere, two is the lowest uh, eigenvalue of the unit sphere. So, so the Neumann uh, uh, eigenvalue mu1 actually goes to 2. And so, and so this is a sequence, if I sh think of shrinking that, I get a sequence of this so that mu1 times the area converges to 8 pi. Uh, and, and it's not achieved. The, the, uh, I can't make a disk which is actually equal to, um, to, uh, to 8 pi. So, so there in fact is an upper bound, but it's, but it's not achieved for the Neumann problem. Okay, so it turns out there's a third eigenvalue problem. It's called the Steklov problem, which, which, which actually has the correct properties. In fact, there are, um, there's a theorem which is, was actually proven 15 years before, before the Hirsch theorem, which is completely analogous to the Hirsch theorem. And so, and so it's, a, it's a setting where, um, where one does have the right um, bound. And, so, and it's related to uh, a different eigenvalue problem, which I want to spend a few slides explaining because it's maybe not so... <clears throat> so standard, uh, and that is, um, it's called the Steklov problem. And so, and so, um, if we take a manifold with boundary, it could be a domain or any uh, Riemannian manifold. Then, um, the Steklov eigenvalue problem is an eigenvalue problem for a, a differential operator, or really a pseudo differential operator, on the boundary of the manifold. So it's very much the boundary geometry, and also the interior geometry, important for the Steklov problem. And so, um, and so what it is is the following. If we take a function on the boundary, let's assume it's smooth, say, uh, then we can, un in a unique way, extend it to the interior. So we, s we do it by solving the Dirichlet problem. That is, we construct a harmonic function inside uh, uh, M in the interior, which agrees with U on the boundary. And we'll call that U hat, that extended function. Then the Dirichlet to Neumann map uh, is the map which sends u, that is the boundary data, to its Neumann data, that is the normal derivative 
uh, the, the, the normal derivative of u hat. And so, and so that's, um, that turns out to be a, um, a very interesting operator. Actually, it's a very important operator in applied mathematics in certain imaging problems. Uh, and, um, and it has <clears throat> the property that like the Laplace operator with Dirichlet Neumann conditions, it has a discrete spectrum. <clears throat> and in particular, let me say a little bit about it. So, so the operator L is a, um, uh, is a self-adjoint operator, uh, self-adjoint with respect to the L2 metric on the boundary. So it takes functions on the boundary to functions on the boundary. Uh, and that's, that follows just from uh, the divergence theorem, or what's sometimes called Green's second formula. Namely, if you take the integral over the boundary of U times LV, so remember LV is the normal derivative of V hat, then that's the same as u hat normal derivative v hat minus v hat normal derivative u hat. Then by uh, uh, the divergence theorem, that's just the, uh, the integral over the interior of u hat Laplace v hat minus v hat Laplace u hat, and that's zero because I've taken harmonic extensions. Okay, and so in particular that says that, um, that L is a self-adjoint operator, which makes its spectrum real, so it means uh, it's if it has discrete uh, eigenvalue, if it has eigenvalues, then the eigenvalues have to be real. Uh, and then the other thing, the, the non-negative definiteness again follows from uh, uh, the divergence theorem. So if you take u, u times the normal derivative u, that's just the Dirichlet integral inside uh, u hat. Because if I apply the divergence theorem, that's the uh, to the gradient u squared, I get um, I get an interior term which is u hat Laplace u hat, which is zero, and then the boundary term is that. Okay, and so in particular. Uh, the integral of u l u is non-negative, and so uh, so the eigenvalues have to be non-negative. Okay, and in fact um, we can see it has discrete spectrum uh, by recalling uh, 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 it's related to the uh, trace embedding of w12 to l2. So if you take a, a function which has square integrable first derivatives, then then it <clears throat> it can the, such a function can be restricted to the boundary of a domain and. And on the boundary of the domain, it's L2, and in fact, the, the restriction map from W12 of M to, to L2 of the boundary is a compact operator. Okay, so that's the relevant uh, information which makes the spectrum discrete. And so, and so it's possible to diagonalize uh, uh, the, and so we can think of, get the eigenvalues by diagonalizing the Dirichlet form, the quadratic form, on the unit sphere of the boundary. So we consider, um, Functions which with L2 norm one on the boundary, and we it's, a, it's the unit sphere in a Hilbert space, and then we consider the quadratic form, which is the integral of grad u squared defined by that, and and that will have a discrete spectrum. So the eigenvalues I'll denote by sigmas for Steklov. So sigma zero, one, two, etc. And again, they the low they're all non-negative, um, and the eigenfunctions are then functions that are harmonic inside. So remember. <clears throat> when we define the operator L, we always take our, function, our extensions to be harmonic, uh, and they satisfy the condition that the normal derivative of ui at the boundary is proportional to ui, so its proportionality constant is the, eigen, the eigenvalue, sigma i. So that, those are the eigenfunctions, so they're, they're, um, <clears throat> they're functions that are harmonic inside, and their normal derivatives are uh, proportion, pr pr proportional to their values on the boundary. Okay, and so those are, those are nice functions. They're, they're actually smooth or analytic up to the boundary, assuming the boundary is smooth. And there's a trivial eigenvalue, namely um, <clears throat> uh, sigma naught equals zero, which corresponds to the constant function. So if I take the boundary, a function constant on the boundary, then of course the, the harmonic extension is constant and uh, the normal derivative of a constant is zero. So, so there's a trivial eigenvalue, as there is in the Neumann uh, case or on a compact manifold. Uh, and um, uh, it has eigenfunctions which are constants, then the, then the next eigenvalue is positive. We assume M is connected. So, um, so we have, again, the first non-trivial eigenfunction. We, we, can, we can characterize eigenfunctions and eigenvalues in, a very, in the same way, uh, a very similar way as we do for the no Dirichlet and Neumann problems. And so, and so they're, uh, they're critical points of uh, what's called a Rayleigh quotient. So if you take the Dirichlet integral and normalize it by dividing by the L2 norm squared, now not on M but on the boundary of M, then uh, the critical points of that, of that quantity, the Rayleigh quotient, are exactly the eigenfunctions. So, so um, uh, and you can, 
you can find them variationally. So you can compute, you can find the kth eigenvalue by minimizing the Rayleigh quotient over functions orthogonal to the first k minus one. So you can construct them inductively as you do, as you can do for um, the Dirichlet and Neumann eigenfunctions. So, so you consider, <clears throat> so for example, the zeroth eigenfunctions are the constants. To get the first one, you look at functions orthogonal to the constants that integrate to zero on the boundary, and then you minimize the Rayleigh quotient. That's, that defines the infimum is sigma one, and the function that realizes the minimum is a lowest eigenfunction. Okay, and that works uh, generally. And so, um, again, the eigenfunctions are nice up to the boundary because uh, the boundary condition is, um, is an elliptic boundary condition. So it's, it's um, um, and so you have perfect regularity. So it's a, so it's a very, uh, I mean, it's a, <clears throat> it's a, um, um, it's a problem that, that, that can be handled by, by standard, so the di diagonalization can be done by standard um, analytic methods. And, and in some ways, the Steklov spectrum is actually simpler than the Dirichlet or Neumann spectrum. So, so let me take a couple of examples. So in, in the case of the ball, in uh, the unit ball uh, in Rn, let's call it Bn, then um, it turns out you can explicitly compute the Steklov eigenvalues. So they're, they're just the, the, the non-negative integers. Um, uh, and, and the eigenfunctions are, um, are uh, just the, the homogeneous harmonic polynomials. So in other words, the eigenfunctions are really the eigenfunctions on Sn minus 1, on the, on the unit n minus, one's, minus 1 sphere, and then uh, extended inside the ball, so taken inside the ball. And, and that just follows from um, um, Euler's formula. So, the, so if you differentiate a homogeneous function on the boundary of the ball, then the normal derivative is uh, is just the degree of homogeneity times the function, and so, and so those form those are all eigenfunctions, and they form a complete orthonormal set. So those are all of the eigenfunctions. So one can do that explicitly, and there's a sort of geometric extension of that to um, cone manifolds. So in general, if you take um, a manifold which is the cone over a compact manifold, so M zero is some n minus one compact manifold, and if I take the cone metric, so I take dr squared plus r squared g naught. So, so that's the same as the Euclidean metric in, in, in spherical coordinates if I took m naught to be the standard n minus 1 sphere. And so, uh, and so again, the same thing is true that the, the, the Steklov eigenfunctions inside are exactly homogeneous extensions of the eigenfunctions of the boundary manifold uh, m0. So this kind of example shows that the Steklov spectrum can reflect the boundary geometry very strongly, as so it th does for the, the case of a cone. Okay, you might worry that the cone is actually singular at the origin, but, but actually the singularity is mild enough that, that it doesn't really affect the, the analysis works, works anyway. So, so that, those are <clears throat> examples. So let me move to part three, which, um, uh, which, um, uh, which is a little background on Steklov eigenvalues. As I said, there's, it turns out there's a theorem um, which is um, which is very analogous to the Hirsch theorem, which was proven uh, uh, 16 years earlier than, than the Hirsch theorem, and it's due, to, um, it's due to Weinstock, so Robert Weinstock. And it actually closely follows the proof, the result I mentioned of Zago for the Neumann uh, eigenvalue. And so um, Weinstock's theorem, which was proven in 1954, says if you take sigma 1 times the length of the boundary, so this, is for, uh, this was originally done for a simply connected plane domain, uh, so we take a simply connected domain in the plane, <clears throat> omega, and then the boundary length, L is the boundary, the length of the boundary, omega. Um, then uh, the Weinstock bound says that if I take an arbitrary plane domain uh, and I look at the product of sigma 1 times the boundary length, then bounded above by 2 pi, and equality is achieved only if omega is a disk. So, so I just told you that, <clears throat> that the lowest uh, non-zero Steklov eigenvalue for a ball, in particular the unit disk, is 1. And the boundary length of the unit disk, of course, is 2 pi. So 2 pi times, times this time, sigma 1 times L is equal to 2 pi for a disk. And again, like in Hirsch's theorem, sigma 1 times L is a scale invariant quantity. So, so uh, again, you could, you could restate the theorem as saying among all simply connected domains with a fixed boundary length, uh, the disk, the round disk, has uh, has largest um, first Steklov eigenvalue. And, and actually, um, it was realized by Weinstock also shortly after that, 
that the proof actually works for arbitrary metrics on the disk. So unlike the Dirichlet and Neumann problems where um, the domain result doesn't extend to arbitrary metrics, this one actually does. It, 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 you, you can replace the uh, metric on the domain by any metric on the disk and the same proof um, goes through. So again, the <clears throat> saying if we normalize the boundary length then the disk uniquely maximizes sigma 1. And, and I'm going to just give the proof because it's actually very simple and very analogous to the proof of Hirsch's theorem. And so, um, so it uses the Riemann mapping theorem. So it's a, it's a special result for simply connected uh, surfaces uh, and uh, says give the proof for plane domain. So, so, there, so, uh, so M could be any simply connected surface with metric, but the, the, the uh, uniformization theorem or the Riemann mapping theorem says that there's a conformal diffeomorphism phi from M to the disk. Okay, and, and, then, and, and so we consider a conformal map from our general surface to the disk. And then, and then the key observation is that, and I think this observation is due to Zago, is that you can then use the, the conformal automorphism group of the disk. So, so you know the disk has a very large automorphism group, uh, as you learn in complex analysis. Just the, um, the fractional linear transformations that preserve the disk are all isometries. Uh, sorry, they're all they're, uh, conformal automorphisms there. They're conformal diffeomorphisms. And so, and so um, in particular, you can exploit that to, um, to balance the map. So the idea is to choose a conformal map f of the disk. Then we can replace phi by f composed with phi. And we can choose an f so that the integral over the boundary of m with respect to the arc length measure of the boundary is 0. So we balance it with respect to a measure, which is the boundary measure uh, on, on, uh, on the boundary of M. And, and so, in, so without loss of generality, we can choose our conformal automorphism, conformal diffeomorphism, so, so that it's balanced on the boundary. So phi is just phi 1, phi 2. Uh, so each, the, each component uh, integrates to 0. And so in particular, we can then use the variational characterization for sigma 1. So sigma 1 says that among all such functions that are balanced, that integrate to 0 on the boundary, um, sigma 1 is the minimum of the ratio, the Rayleigh quotient. And what I've done here is I've multiplied through by the denominator. So this is the denominator in the Rayleigh quotient, and that's the numerator. And so sigma 1 times, times integral phi i squared is bounded by the Dirichlet integral. And then if I sum, I get, um, I get sigma 1 times the sum of phi i squared. But, but phi was a map from the uh, diffeomorphism from the domain to the unit circle. So, so, so it takes the boundary of the domain to, to, sorry, to the unit disk, so it takes the boundary of the domain to the circle. So that means the sum of phi i squared is 1, pointwise. And so on the left I get sigma 1 times the length. Uh, and on the right I get the Dirichlet integral of the map, the conformal map. And it's not hard to see that the Dirichlet integral of a conformal map uh, is just twice the area of the image. Okay, so the, the Dirichlet, the the Dirichlet integral is twice the Jacobian of the map, and when you integrate the Jacobian determinant, you get the area of the image. It's a diffeomorphism. And so it's two times the area of the image, which is the, the image is the unit disk, so that's, uh, that's two times pi, or two pi. So, so that's the proof. So it's very, very simple and very elegant, uh, very elegant proof. But on the other hand, it's extremely special. It, it works only for the, um, for the, uh, the unit disk. If, if you looked at a domain which is um, which is uh, not, not simply connected. So if you took, say, a, an annular domain, so if we took this domain and we removed some, <clears throat> look at the domain here, then, then the proof doesn't work. There's, there's, there's not a similar result. And in fact, it's false. It, it's, it's, it's very easy to, to check that if you consider annuli, which just consider, consists of the unit disk minus a small disk centered at the origin, which is removed, then that actually violates the Weinstock estimate. So in other words, if you look at sigma 1 times the length of the boundary, it's bigger than 2 pi. And so, and so it's not true for other, for non-simply connected domains. And so, and so the question is, what is the, sh what, what is the sharp bound? So the, the, it turns out there is an upper bound uh, for any surface with boundary, which depends only on the topology. And so, and so I did that. In fact, this work I'm talking about is a joint work with Ilana Fraser. So she and I gave an upper bound, which is this first one. And then um, uh, a few, uh, shortly after that, a few years later, uh, uh, Kokorev gave an upper bound, which is this one. Which So Kokorev's bound uses the Hirsch-type arguments. It's related to... 
um, conformal maps to the two sphere. And so um, the difference is that the uh, Kokorev bound doesn't depend on k. So, so here the genus is gamma and k is the number of boundary components. So if I take a surface with, uh, uh, if I take a compact surface with boundary, then it's always topologically uh, some um, closed surface of some genus. So it has some genus and then I remove a certain number of dis. I remove k dis. So, so any surface, any compact surface, well if it's orientable, any compact surface with boundary is parameterized by two numbers topologically, the genus and the, and the number of boundary components. Okay, and, so, and so if we take an arbitrary metric on such a uh, surface, then, uh, then it turns out there's, a, there's an upper bound. It depends only on the topology of the surface. It doesn't depend on the metric at all. And so, um, and so the equality is, is um, we expect equality to be strict here except in the Weinstock case. Uh, the Weinstock case would be gamma zero k is one. Uh, and in that case, this first, the first bound is, is achieved, it's 2 pi. Um, and we know that for genus zero, the inequality is strict, but we don't really know whether it's, uh, whether, whether the first bound, well actually the second bound can never be achieved, but uh, whether the first one could be in some case is not, actually not really clear. Um, okay, and so, um, so, so in particular, we then, because we know there's an upper bound on sigma one times the length, we can pose the variational problem. We can ask, well, what's the optimal metric? So if we take, um, um, if we take, so as I said, or oriented surfaces are parameterized by these two numbers, uh, then we can ask the question, what's the maximizing metric uh, for a given topology? So, so, um, so suppose we take annular surfaces and we, we consider arbitrary metrics, then what metric on the annulus realizes the maximum of sigma one times l? And so, so it should be a it should be a metric which contains a lot of geometric information. It should be a very natural, uh, natural metric. So it's kind of eigenvalue optimization problem. Um, okay, and so we made some progress. Actually, in general, we don't know very much about this, but we've been able to do this in some cases. And so, so just to kind of summarize roughly what I'm going to tell you, and then I'll give you more details. Uh, what, what we've done is, for metrics on the annulus, we were able to completely characterize this, this solution. So we, we, we were able to describe in an explicit way the, the, met, uh, the metric on an annulus which achieves the, the maximum. And it, it's a particular rotationally invariant metric, so it's an S1, uh, S1 invariant, and it has equal boundary circles, and it's a particular, uh, a particular um, conformal structure on, on the annulus. Um, okay, and we're also able to handle the problem for genus zero. So we can show that, that for any genus zero surface, that is any topology, any domain which is, uh, any, any surface which is topologically a plane domain, uh, we can construct a maximizing metric, and we're able to describe, at least asymptotically, what happens to uh, the, the, um, the, um, uh, the maximum value uh, as k goes to infinity. And it, it, turns out that, um, it turns out that what we show is that, so if you, if you take uh, k here to be the number of boundary components, remember gamma is zero. So we have the, we have the, uh, the Weinstock case, which is two pi. This is, <clears throat> this, this is k equals one. And then the next one is bigger. So this is k equals two. That would be the annular case. And what happens is these increase and they converge at, uh, up to at to four pi, so so we get we can prove that the 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 maxima the maximum value for genus zero with k boundary components is always between two pi and four pi, strictly increasing in k, and the limit as k tends to infinity is four pi. So so we're able to give at least a rough description of of uh, what happens in the problem in the genus zero case, and um, the theorems are proven by a rather interesting geometric construction. So the way we did it is we, we managed to connect this problem to another one which, um, uh, which we're able to say something about. And so, and so the key is that there's, a, there's a, um, a natural geometric characterization of these extremals, assuming they exist. And so let me describe that. So, so if we have a, if we have a um, maximizing metric uh, then the following theorem is true. So, so if I take a, um, um, <clears throat> if I assume that I have a, say a smooth metric that maximizes sigma one times the boundary length for a, on a surface, then what happens is the multiplicity of sigma one 
cannot be one, it's at least two. So, so it's sort of natural that, that you would expect the, the, the largest, the maximizing metric to be to the eigenvalue to have higher multiplicity. So you kind of expect that, you expect it to be a special uh, situation and, and in kind of symmetric situations, uh, you would expect multiplicity. So the multiplicity is at least two and there exists a proper map by first eigenfunctions. So I'm calling it phi, so let's say they're n eigenfunctions and it goes to the ball, the unit ball and it's a conformal map. So in other words, you can, you can put together n eigenfunctions and they, and they give you a map from m to the unit ball and it's a proper map. It takes the, the interior of m to the interior of the ball and the boundary of m to the boundary of the ball and it's a conformal map. So it's what's called a, it's a, a minimal immersion. So a conformal harmonic map is a minimal immersion and so the picture is that you get b, b n here and then the eigenfunctions give you an embedding to uh, a, a very special kind of minimal immersion which meets the boundary orthogonally. So, so the, the Steklov boundary condition then uh, 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 is related to the fact that the surface you get uh, is, um, is, uh, is a, what's called a free boundary minimal surface. In other words, the, 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 um, the surface meets the boundary uh, sphere orthogonally. Okay, and that, that, that's, a, that's a, um, a uh, theorem. So if I have a minimizing metric, then I can realize it as the induced metric from the ball on, from the Euclidean space on such a free boundary minimal surface. And, and in fact, the, so in other words, this, the, 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 the mapping is, it's not quite an isometric embedding, but it's a, it's a homothety. So it's a conformal mapping, which on the boundary is a homothety. That means the derivative is constant on the boundary. And, and that's, um, uh, and that means that the induced metric is really equivalent to uh, to the given metric. So we could think of the maximizing metric as the induced metric on this minimal surface. Uh, and so let me clarify that in a few more slides. So, um, so, uh, so, so if I take um, uh, minimal surface of sigma in the ball, they could be of any dimension uh, and they're orthogonal to the boundary, to the, um, uh, to the sphere along the boundary. That's called a free boundary uh, submanifold and they're characterized by the condition that the coordinate functions are Steklov eigenfunctions with eigenvalue 1. So the coordinate functions are harmonic with respect to the um, the induced metric on uh, sigma and the free boundary condition uh, is the condition that the normal derivative that is uh, del 8, 8 is the the, uh, the normal vector here. <coughs> And of course the normal vector, because it's a free boundary, um, a minimal surface is just the position vector, right? Because it meets the, uh, the boundary orthogonally. And so, and so uh, the coordinate functions are harmonic, that's just the minimality, and then this is the boundary, the boundary condition. Okay, and so the theorem on the previous slide shows that surfaces of this type um, uh, arise as eigenvalue extremals, and so we showed that any, any eigenvalue extremal would be would produce a surface of this type, uh, and but they also arise variationally. So, so I'm, I've been interested for a long time in the plateau problem, uh, volume uh, minimization, and um, they also arise naturally as uh, uh, min-max uh, solutions for uh, what are called relative cycles in the ball. So, if you consider uh, if you consider a submanifold of the ball, which which um, which uh, has boundary on the boundary of the ball, then you can do area extremization. If you minimize you get zero but you can do sort of min-max constructions and you produce precisely this class of minimal submanifold. So it's a different way of thinking about uh, a different point of view on this, uh, on this uh, class of minimal submanifolds. Okay and so let me give some, uh, well let me first, I have some more pictures here. So uh, yeah, so again uh, the, the requirement is that um, M is proper in the ball, so, so the boundary of M goes to the boundary of the ball. Okay, and the minimality condition, H equals zero, is equivalent to saying the, the coordinate functions are harmonic. Uh, and then the normal, the unit normal, outward normal is the position vector. And so the, the orthogonality condition at the boundary is precisely the statement that, that when I differentiate the coordinate functions in the direction of the normal, which is the position vector, I just reproduce the, the uh, the uh, normal vector, and so, and so, 
And so any free boundary minimal surface has built in, namely just the coordinate functions, a collection of Steck law of eigenfunctions with eigenvalue 1. Okay, so that's the geometric part. So let me give some examples. So, um, um, so the first example is just a flat disk. If we take a disk through the origin, it could be a k-dimensional disk, uh, equatorial disk, then of course it's, uh, it's minimal, it's a uh, zero second fundamental form, and it, of course it meets the boundary sphere orthogonally. And so actually in the middle 80s, uh, Nietzsche proved that any simply connected free boundary minimal surface in B3 is a flat disk. So in the simply connected case, uh, <clears throat> Nietzsche proved that at least in the three-dimensional case, the flat disk is the only simply connected solution. And actually Fraser and I looked at the question in higher dimensions, and to our surprise we were able to prove the same result. So it turns out if you if you take uh, a free boundary, simply connected free boundary surface in Bn for any n, it, it, it still it's, is again a flat disk. So, um, so that was a bit of a surprise to us, but it, it turns it follows by so the proofs of the theorems are using by complex analytic methods. It, it uses um, um, it uses complex analytic methods, and, and it turns out that the um, that the the result. Um, uh, the rigidity result generalizes to higher dimensions. On the other hand, if we, if we move to the catenoid, uh, sorry, to the annulus, then we get another obvious example in B3, uh, and that's called the critical catenoid. So this is a picture of the hyperbolic cosine curve, x equals cosh z, z is the vertical axis. Right, it's a little too small to read there. Uh, and uh, this curve is characterized by the fact that when you revolve it about the z-axis, it's, it's, it's a minimal surface, and up to scaling, it's the unique uh, minimal surface of revolution. Uh, and so if you take that curve and you draw a tangent line from the origin, a line, uh, a ray which is tangent to the catenoid at a point, there's a unique such ray, uh, and then if you draw the circle uh, of whose radius, so you draw the circle centered at the origin containing that point of tangency, uh, then you, you take, you, you cut off the portion of the catenoid inside the circle and revolve it about the axis, then you get a free boundary minimal annulus. Namely, it's, uh, it's a minimal surface inside and it meets the boundary orthogonally because of the tangency condition. And of course the punchline, I mean to give away the, 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 uh, the, the punchline, this is the extreme, the optimal so, surface. So, so, the, so one of the main theorems is that the critical catenoid uniquely maximizes sigma 1 times the length for, among annuli. Okay, and so uh, there's a recent paper which I actually posted just a couple weeks ago, uh, finally, by uh, Kapoleas and Lee, where they, um, they actually constructed an infinite number of free boundary uh, minimal surfaces with three boundary components. So their construction uh, is a kind of... <clears throat> so it's, uh, it, it takes the union of the critical catenoid. So we have the critical catenoid here, and we have the disk through the origin. So when we take the union of those two, we get a, uh, a singular surface. We get a surface with, um, uh, which is uh, immersed and, and uh, there's a circle of intersections. So along that circle, the two, the two surfaces intersect, in fact, orthogonally. And, um, and what they do is they show that you can approximate this, um, this uh, uh, immersed surface by embeddings if you put in lots and lots of handles around there. So you, you can take uh, you can take, uh, you can get smooth embedded free boundary minimal surfaces whose boundaries will be very close to these three circles. They, not exactly th three circles, but, um, but, but they have three boundary components and very high genus. As the genus goes to infinity, they converge to this, this union. So that's a, called a desingularization, which often happens in minimal, minimal surface theory. Um, and so there's a, a family of examples like that. And let me also mention, um, so we also looked at the problem for the Mobius band, and, and again, the, the extremal metric on the Mobius band, it turns out, can be given explicitly. And, um, and uh, it's, um, let me describe it here. So um, um, if we think of the Mobius band as R cross S1, uh, where we identify points, the, so T, T is the R, the variable in R, and theta is the variable in S1. If we identify uh, T theta with minus T theta plus pi, then we get a Mobius band. And, and it turns out there's an explicit minimal embedding of the Mobius band into R4. And I've written it down here, separated form. Each of those functions is a harmonic function on the, on the product uh, R cross S1. So it's a product of a hyperbolic, uh, a trig function times a uh, 
times a trig function with the same um, uh, of the same um, mode, and so uh, and so th this this particular um, this particular map phi, phi, phi of t theta consisting of four harmonic functions turns out to be conformal. So the constants are chosen so that so that it's point it's it gives a conformal map into R four and. Um, uh, like the critical catenoid, there's a unique choice of T naught. So if you cut it off, uh, you cut off a portion of it, then uh, it, uh, it it meets the boundary of the ball orthogonally, and so and so that we call that the critical Mobius band. And so and so again, to give away the punchline, the the theorem, one of the other main theorems, is that the critical Mobius band, in fact, uniquely realizes the maximum for for geometries for metrics on the Mobius band. Okay. So. Uh, so those are important examples. Um, let me also mention in the annulus case. So, so you you might think that the 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 annulus is sort of unique, and and uh, it it is it possibly is unique in in B three. We don't really know know whether that's true or not. But it turns out if you look at annuli in B four, there are an infinite number of S one invariant ones, and and actually they were constructed in an interesting paper by uh, three Chinese authors, Fan, Tam, and Yu, where they studied higher Steklov eigenvalues, extremizing them uh, on uh, annuli which are S one invariant, so metrics that are S one invariant. They didn't solve the full problem, that is, where you consider arbitrary metrics, but by considering S one invariant metrics, they were able to show that for for Lots of the eigenvalues, in fact, in fact, um, all of, sigma k except when k is two, they were able to construct a maximizer, and they were able to show the maximizer actually gives rise to a free boundary minimal annulus in B4. And I've written these down explicitly. Again, they're written in separated form. There's a whole sequence of them. It's rather surprising how many there are. So these are, so each one of these for each n is an embedded free boundary. Uh, minimal annulus in B4, the four-dimensional ball, and um, as n goes to infinity, the areas will blow up, so they become more and more complicated. So there are lots of these things. Um, and then in higher dimensions, I mentioned the cone example in general, partly to because uh, one obvious set of examples are, are minimal cones. So, so minimal cones play an important role in minimal the theory of minimal submanifolds and and if you take so a minimal cone means you take a minimal submanifold of the sphere and you take the cone over it and so those are examples of free boundary minimal surfaces and then there are also a bunch more that were constructed um, uh, earlier this year by <coughs> by uh, these three authors so there are many many examples now and actually our work really really generated a huge um, uh, interest in constructing more of them so they're by no means classified but there are there are lots and lots of lots and lots of examples. Okay, and so let me now. I've already given away the punchline because I was going to run out of time. But uh, but let me uh, let me now describe more explicitly the the theorems that we that we uh, proved. So these are joint with uh, Ilana Fraser, uh, and so um, so we want to show the critical catenoid achieves the the maximum. So how do we do that? Well, we have to figure out some way to characterize the critical catenoid, and so the characterization is here in theorem A. And it says if we take any free boundary minimal annulus in Bn, so so we know there are lots of those, right? The fan tam u ones, there are an infinite number of them in B4. But if we assume that the coordinate functions are first eigenfunctions, so all of those other ones will have the property that the coordinate functions are eigenfunctions, but they're not the first ones. So if you assume they're the first ones, then we're able to show it's the critical catenoid. So so we're able to show that n is actually three and sigma is the critical catenoid. So that's theorem A. So that's the characterization we need. Uh, and then there's a similar result for the, um, for the critical Mobius band. So it says that if we <clears throat> take any free boundary minimal Mobius band in Bn, uh, coordinate functions are first eigenfunctions, then we have to be in four dimensions and it's the critical Mobius band. So those are two uniqueness theorems. And, um, um, <clears throat> uh, and so um, let me um, now state the higher Connect the, the, the case of more boundary components. So, so generally, uh, we showed that if you take, um, uh, say, oriented surfaces of genus gamma and k boundary components, the eigenvalue sigma 1 times L is bounded from above. And so we can then look at a number, which is the soup. So we'll call that sigma star. So we take the, the soup over smooth metrics of sigma 1 uh, times L. Uh, and then that's a finite number. We have, a, we have an upper bound on it. 
Okay, and, and, and then, um, uh, and so in particular, sigma star of zero, one is two pi, that's just the Weinstock theorem. And then we can, we can state the minimal annulus theorem in this form. So, so if I take any, any metric on an annulus, then sigma one L is bounded above by, by that for the critical catenoid. And, and you can compute that number at least, uh, you can approximate the number as closely as you want. And again, it's unique. Equality holds if and only if m is equivalent. And that number, so sigma star of 0, 2, it turns out is about 4 pi over 1.2. So in this picture, it's 2 pi, and then this number is about 4 pi over 1.2. Um, and then um, <clears throat> for higher k, the, the, the statement is that uh, uh, this number is strictly increasing in k, and it converges to 4 pi. K tends to infinity. And for each K, there's a maximizing metric. It's achieved by a free boundary minimal surface in B3. So they, they, they all sit in B3. Uh, and the area is strictly less than 2 pi, less than twice a disk. And the limit of those minimal surfaces is a double disk. And so the reason we're able to uh, understand the asymptotics is because we can prove that the geometric surfaces actually converge to a double disk. And so let me draw the picture. So here's a rough picture. So, so the idea is that the, for k very large, the extremal metric looks like two disks, so that's supposed to be a flat disk on top and a flat disk on the bottom, and then sort of boundary necks that join them, so there will be k holes on the boundary. And this is an artist's rendition, which has nothing to do really with the problem, but, but it's uh, something that looks roughly like like uh, it should. So, so the, way, the way I like to visualize it is the, describe the optimal configuration is the following. So think of taking the sphere and then on the equator punch out k holes, k small holes around the equator. So then you get an upper part, upper hemisphere, lower hemisphere, and then you get the k holes. Now squeeze the air out of it. So push the upper one down and the lower one up until they're, they're almost, uh, uh, they're, they're very close together. So in the interior it's a like a double disc, and at the boundary it's joined by these necks. And I, actually, you can also characterize the shape of the necks. They're, they're again, related to the, to the catenoid. Okay, and so that's, um, that's, the, that's the reason we're able to prove this asymptotic theorem, because we can analyze these limits. And so there's a general, what goes into it is a general existence theorem, the existence of minimizers, which I stated here. So, so we're able to do this only so far in the genus zero case. So if it's genus zero with k boundary components, then there exists a smooth uh, metric. And so that, that's actually a hard analytic theorem. Um, a good part of the paper is involved with proving that. Um, and, then, um, and then I can <clears throat> give the outline of the proof for the, um, for the annulus. So if I took a metric, a metric on an annulus, then I want to prove this, this theorem one, which I stated earlier. So the, the way it works is step one, there exists a, a metric which, uh, which achieves the extremal. And so uh, we have that metric. And then the the characterizing condition for maximizing metrics, remember, was that you can, can, you can find eigenfunctions which give you a free boundary uh, minimal immersion. Okay, so, that, so then by the characterization of, of extremals, I get a free boundary minimal immersion by first eigenfunctions. And then the uniqueness theorem, theorem A that I, I stated a few slides back, says that, so I then have a free boundary minimal annulus, and the coordinate functions, which are the embedding functions, are first Steklov eigenfunctions, and therefore I have uniqueness, I get the critical catenoid. So, it's, so the proof is pretty hard. I mean, it, it's nothing like the Weinstock proof, in the sense it's not nearly so so, so simple as that. Uh, you have to, there's this hard analytic theorem which asserts the existence of a maximizer, and then there's a uniqueness theorem which characterizes the, the, uh, the maximizer. And so uh, let me skip the proof of the k going to infinity since I'm going to run out of time. Um, but the proof for the Mobius band is similar. It follows the same, um, uh, the same, the same steps. The, the existence of the metric and then, and then the maximizer. So in the remaining five minutes, I want to I talk about a very recent paper uh, which we posted, which has to do with higher dimensional questions. So, so it's natural to ask, well, does any of this stuff generalize to higher dimensions? And actually, the answer is pretty much no. I mean, if you, if you consider, um, like if you try to generalize the Hirsch theorem to higher dimensions, if you consider metrics on S3 uh, with, say, unit volume, fixed volume, you can actually make the lowest eigenvalue go to infinity. So there's no upper bound on on lambda one, so it's quite a different situation. However, for domains in Rn, there are some results. In particular, there's a, a nice theorem from 2001, which is due to Brock, which says if you 
if you normalize the volume of the domain, so you, you consider domains of a given volume, then the maximizing, uh, the domain that maximizes sigma 1 is a ball. So it's, so, so, it's, so it's not like the Weinstock theorem. The Weinstock theorem normalizes the boundary volume. So here you're normalizing the interior volume. And so Brock's theorem says that if you normalize the interior volume, you get the ball. Now that, that turns out to be a weaker theorem than, than, um, than Weinstock's theorem. Um, and so, so the, 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 the result for with, with normalized boundary volume implies the Brock, would imply the Brock theorem by the isoparametric inequality. Because if you, <clears throat> if, you, if you normalize the interior volume, then the boundary volume has to be greater than the volume of the ball. And so, and so from there you can see that, that, that if you have a theorem like Weinstock's theorem with, that works with the boundary volume normalized, then, then that, it, that would imply Brock's theorem. So Brock's theorem is strictly weaker than, than the Weinstock theorem, but the Weinstock theorem only holds for simply connected domains. But, so you might, ask, you might ask then, is there an extension of uh, the Weinstock theorem to higher dimensions? And so, so for example, if the Weinstock theorem says any domain which is diffeomorphic to the disk, um, uh, for any domain diffeomorphic to the disk, sigma 1L is bounded above by, by that for the disk. And so the answer is no. So, so in this recent paper that was posted just a couple weeks ago, we showed that uh, we constructed domains in Rn for n greater than or equal to 3, which are diffeomorphic to the ball, have the same boundary volume as the ball, but have strictly larger sigma 1. And so, and so it's not true. Brock's theorem doesn't generalize to normalizing boundary volumes. In fact, actually, it's sort of interesting because if you consider domains with a fixed boundary volume, there is an upper bound on sigma 1 times, on, on sigma 1, uh, but it's not achieved by the ball. And so the question of what, you know, whether it's achieved or what that domain would be is completely, I have no idea. Um, um, and the other thing is, um, in uh, the basic the theorems I described, the number of boundary components is very important in the two-dimensional case. And we showed, I mean, the key actually to proving the, the result about high, a large number of boundary components was that if we add boundary components, we make this number strictly bigger. So, so, so we can increase the size of sigma 1 times the boundary length by adding boundary components. And so, and so that, that also fails for n greater than or equal to 3. In fact, the general result is here. If I take any compact Riemannian manifold, with non-empty boundary and greater than or equal to 3, and um, I take any epsilon positive, then I can find a smooth subdomain with connected boundary such that the volumes are almost the same, the, um, the boundary volumes are almost the same, and the sigma 1s are almost the same. So that result is false in, for two-dimensional surfaces, but in higher dimensions uh, it's true also. So, so in other words, you can't really detect the number of boundary components from this uh, extremal problem. And so actually the idea of the proof for both results is, is, is similar. Um, it, it, we consider the effect of adding thin tubes in higher dimensions. So, so I've drawn a picture, actually I just found that on the internet. I think it was, <clears throat> maybe it was a, a record, uh, uh, a vinyl record. I'm not sure what the picture was intended to be, but this is supposed to be a three-dimensional picture. So there's an outer uh, sphere on the outside and a sphere on the inside. And then I've taken two points here and I've joined them by a thin tube. So think of drawing a line and then thickening it up a little bit. And then <clears throat> it turns out that, um, that such a situation, if you choose the, the outer sphere to be a unit sphere and the inner sphere to be small enough, uh, then it turns out this is an example uh, which violates the uh, higher dimensional uh, Weinstock theorem. And, and the proof, the connectedness proof is similar. So, so in two dimensions, when you do that, you add a lot of boundary length and you also get eigenfunctions that concentrate near that, that tube. In higher dimensions, the tube is sort of negligible. It's, it's sort of has zero, it has zero capacity. So, so that's the, the main difference, really. So it's a, it's a very elementary construction, but it shows that, it shows that um, the results you might expect to be true actually don't generalize, even, even for domains in the in Rn to higher dimensions. Okay, so sorry, I, I think I'm just on time, so let me stop there. Yes. Um, I was wondering along some general lines, um, this problem of extremality of eigenvalues, 
Um, is it related in any way to other extremal problems in geometry? In particular, I was thinking about besson courtois garou theorem for the minimal volume entropy problem uh -huh. for manifolds that are meet a negative curvature metric. With negative curvature, yes. uh-huh. Will that give you anything about eigenvalues or um, too rough? I, I see. It's, a, it's sort of, um, yeah, I, I see that it's, it's kind of similar spirit, but um, I, I don't know of any, any technical connection, any direct connection between, between those. Um, yeah, um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know. For, so for one thing, that, um, okay, I see. So that's, that's a question of characterizing like hyperbolic, uh, uh, so the, the hyperbolic the spaces. If, if your manifold that meets the negative curvature metric, yeah. This is BCG, but yes, Bessa yes, Quartal. Yes. Quartal. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. So that that proof actually does use some spectral theory, I think. Yeah. But it, but it's not um, right. Yeah. I, I don't know of any direct connection. But that that's that one one thing that's true. It, it's as a variational problem. It's uh, it's a non-local problem yeah. in the sense that uh, often with variational problems you're just minimizing some integral of a density function, right? So here the eigenvalue is some kind of functional of the metric. But you have to know the whole metric in order to determine. Uh, it's not locally determined, and so I think that problem has the similar feature mm -hmm. as that. But uh, but no, I don't know of uh, I don't know of a connection there. Um, and the second question, if I may, uh, I was also thinking of um, what's called Mazia inequality or maybe Chigier inequality that relates uh, this um, Laplacian first Laplacian eigenvalue and um, some kind of isochronometric constant. On a manifold, yeah. it goes in both ways. And um, here my intuition comes from spectral graph theory. There it's interesting that there are some extreme cases where you can characterize extreme cases in terms of spectrum, but you cannot do that in terms of isochronometric constant. So I was wondering whether in your case you well, have that, some characterization of extreme mm, metrics. That, that is a similar kind of problem. So it would be looking at trying to find the graph that maximizes, maybe under some normalization, that maximizes an eigenvalue. Yeah, I mean, there is a discrete analog to, uh, of it. Actually, there's a lot of work on trying to do this for the Dirichlet eigenvalues, say, for a domain in Rn. And there are some results. I think, in general, if you take, um, so, so for sigma 1, it's the ball. But if you take sigma 2, for example, they don't know what it is. But there are results that assert the existence of a of an extremal. And I think the boundary is rectifiable or something like that. There's some sort of results in the uh, in the sort of geometric measure theory setting, but sure, you could also pose a similar question in in the discrete graphical case. It could be interesting, I think, to you know to understand those graphs which maximize. They're somehow the most efficient. Uh, they're the ones with the um, with the lowest frequency, uh, the fundamental tone. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, so yeah, they're 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 natural in a certain way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that problem is directly analogous. I would say. Question is just incidentally related to something we discussed today in the morning with a colleague. So uh, one one problem uh, uh, I'm very much interested on the analytical side is the so-called welding problem, which says that you have two disks yeah. and you have some some diffeomorphism between their boundaries, and you want to understand whether you can introduce so this topologically sphere whether you can introduce the minor structure. So you want to, so you have two, two so uh, this in the plane, and yeah. You have some bijection between their boundaries. On the boundaries, yeah. Uh, and if, if it's smooth, for example, you can always uh, glue it and uh, realize it as a Riemann sphere. Okay, but yeah. Actually, I'll force Beer's theorem says that you can do it if it's quasi-symmetric. Oh, okay, uh, yeah. For example, mm -hmm. if there is one point of non-smoothness that already becomes, uh, if it's seen hinge with one point of non-smoothness, can be the natural remaining metric gives you some curve which curves around a uh, a hole the size of a disk, and uh, right. so were there any any such optimization problem uh, solved for, for for the similar kind of things? So it's basically you you have two disks, but then you want to solve them simultaneously with some funny relation of boundary values, uh, which which a priori might lead to something very non-trivial. Mm -hmm. so for example, mm -hmm. not 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 leading to a disk or to a yeah. disk here. Um. Uh, uh, let's see. I mean, of course, um, 
you could you could look at harmonic mappings with the given. You could extend harmonically, I guess. But in general, you won't get a um, you won't get a diffeomorphism inside uh, when you do that. Um, I don't know whether this problem. Yeah, I, 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 the answer is I don't know. Uh, but I, I guess you could take <clears throat> you could somehow take the diffeomorphism, the the homeomorphism on the boundary, and extend it, and then you could pull back the metric and try to compare those those metrics and yes. try. And the idea would be to to make them as close as possible somehow. And so you want to. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can see that it could be related, but I, I don't know of any work in that in that direction. No. Let's let's thank our speaker again.